As the Academy Awards ceremony approaches, Bong Joon-ho has become something like a household name in North America, the first South Korean filmmaker to be nominated for Best Foreign Language Film, as well as for Best Director and Best Picture. The emergence of Bong's class satire thriller Parasite, already awarded at Cannes with a Palme d'Or, as a strong Oscar contender is one of the most interesting and for many inspiring stories of the year, the ascent of a gifted, idiosyncratic director from the festival circuit to the global mainstream. For his part, Bong seems to be enjoying the ride, joking at the Golden Globes about breaking down the one-inch barrier that subtitles put between his work and American audiences, and even mocking the Oscars as a quote, local awards ceremony, a cutting observation about the long history of excellent foreign cinema denied the kind of acclaim greeting his own work. Everybody loves Bong, and yet for a filmmaker who has cultivated unprecedented consensus with Parasite, he is hardly a conventional crowd pleaser. His work over the last 20 years has always had a commercial element, with deep connections to genre tropes rooted in horror and science fiction. But he's also a sly social satirist and a master of the kind of tonal shifts that could give unsuspecting viewers whiplash. His films are brilliantly crafted entertainments, but they're also often strange and unsettling, anticipating and subverting audience expectations, or else turning Spielberg style showmanship into its own form of analysis. In this video, I've taken a look at the style and themes of Bong's films from his debut all the way through Parasite, a deep dive into a body of work as robust and impressive as anything in contemporary cinema. Bong's debut feature, Barking Dogs Never Bite, came out in the year 2000, around the same time that a cycle of strong and in some cases surreal and violent films were emerging from South Korea, a new wave of titles whose popularity at home was duplicated abroad on the international festival circuit. As a humorous movie about animal abuse, Barking Dogs was obviously going to test some viewers' tolerance, but the joke lies not in the cruel treatment of its canine characters, but rather its suggestion that modern life brings out the anxious, cornered predator within us all. The film is about an uptight graduate student whose frustration with a lack of money or professional opportunity gets displaced into anger at a noisy dog in his downtown apartment complex. The animal becomes first a scapegoat and then a potential sacrificial victim on the altar of his rage. This begins a rash of pet kidnappings and even killings involving human characters living and working on the building's lower levels, a visual and narrative structure that Bong uses to replicate the dog-eat-dog -dog logic of late capitalism. Alternating between massive master shots and kinetic tracks down corridors and across rooftops, Bong turns the apartment block into a kind of chase movie playground, as well as a character in its own right, using its drab concrete exterior and hellish lower levels to stand in for modernity at large. The building is like a kennel, and at one point we see our hero struggling to get out via a makeshift doggy door. In the end, the camera and the characters escape the building to commune with nature, a trope that will turn in some of Bong's later films, along with other traits that get their first work out here, like the mix of slapstick comedy and morbid subject matter, and also the way that within the film's plot, small grievances spiral out of control. Barking Dogs' Never Bite is modest compared to the rest of Bong's movies, but it's still extremely impressive. You can see a major talent in formation. <laughs> Early on in Memories of Murder, a detective played by Song Kang Ho traces a circle at the edge of a crime scene. He's trying to establish a perimeter, but he's also cueing some beautifully circular camera movement that establishes Bong's directorial control at the same time that it shows how undisciplined and chaotic this police investigation is. When one cop tumbles down an embankment, it's a sight gag with a morbid punchline. A few seconds later, we see the bound and mutilated corpse of a murder victim. Loosely based on a true story, Bong's second feature, set in the mid-1980s, is both an homage to and culturally specific satire of police procedurals. 
Unable to solve the case of South Korea's first recorded serial killer, Song Kang-ho's character is joined by a big city cop, played by Kim Sang-kyung, who condescends to his new partner's unsophisticated methods. And the tension between these two detectives plays out as an allegory for the country's rural and urban populations, while meanwhile around the edges of the frame we see signs of a collective top-down authoritarianism that reminds us of South Korea's dictatorial political history and hints that such a repressive government regime becomes a breeding ground for perverse, uncategorizable forms of evil in hidden places. Bong draws on the visual vocabulary of Western thrillers and horror movies, including Nick Rogue's classic Don't Look Now, evoked in the detail of the serial killer's victims always wearing red. Bong's use of a subjective camera to charge rainy nighttime sequences with menace equals the work of John Carpenter in Halloween. But in lieu of a Michael Myers-style boogeyman, Memories of Murder keeps its antagonist unseen and anonymous. In this way, it's closer in tone to David Fincher's Zodiac, a movie that Bong idolizes. Its true subject is the impossibility of knowing anything in a contingent universe. Song's character uses what he calls an eye contact method to interrogate suspects, believing that he can see bad guys and their guilt with his own eyes. But his perceptions are faulty, and objective truth, the kind of truth advocated by his partner with his big city forensic methods, proves elusive in the end. In Memories of Murder's stunning final sequence, we are confronted with the image of the detective whose inability to solve the case haunts him later in his life, scrutinizing the audience as if trying to spot the quote, normal looking killer among us. A moment that Bong orchestrates so that it works on a metaphorical level, but also as a direct provocation to the real killer, who may have well attended a screening of Memories of Murder at some point during its run. It's hard to choose between Bong's movies. They're all very strong. For me, Memories of Murder is, if not his best movie, maybe the one where his combination of style and theme is the most precise. It's epically long, but it doesn't feel like there's a wasted moment in it. I poured him right down the drain, Mr. Kim. If I pour them in the drain, they run into the Han River. That's right. Let's just dump them in the Han River. In the prologue of The Host, two fishermen lose track of a tiny, insignificant catch. In time, the creature that they let go will grow into a problem of unimaginable size. And that's the socio-political subtext of the host, which is that the monster that spawns in the Han River in Seoul is a byproduct of neglect, long-standing American military presence in Seoul, and then that literally toxic neglect of civic and national governments as to the consequences of that. The monster is a byproduct of a damaged society and it rampages through the city early in the film in a spectacular daylight set piece that goes against all of the post-Jaws wisdom, all of the post-Aliens wisdom of waiting to show your character until you have to. Bong inverts Steven Spielberg's rhythms even as he pays him tribute, including the ruthlessness to imperil a child. In this case, the preteen daughter of the slow-witted hero, again played by Song Kang-ho, who tragically loses track of her during the monster stampede, a moment that Bong distends into agonizing slow motion. Narratively, the host takes the form of an extended rescue operation in which the girl's family, a group of losers at odds with success in society, gradually banding together. But as fast-paced and as pulpy as the movie is, it also displays Bong's devastating emotional acuity and his elasticity of tone. In one of the most moving sequences of his career, we see the family gathered together for dinner while the little girl scurries around the table, a melancholy figment of their collective imagination, a reminder of happier times, and also in a sadder way, a reminder of the task at hand, a sort of structuring absence to their sadness. As an overall stylistic flex, the host is incredibly impressive, skillfully integrating special effects into the same fleet tracking shot camera movements that defined memories of murder and barking dogs never bite. And it is wonderfully satisfying near the end of the film when our heroes finally rouse themselves and combine their talents, incredible style, to take the monster down. 
a climax with the clean, forceful power of a great comic book or a great superhero movie. At the same time, as in Memories of Murder, Bong subverts convention by focusing more than most filmmakers would on collateral damage. He has the guts to kill off the little girl, while also showing that in death she has saved an even weaker figure from the same fate. The image of this younger generation paying for the sins of their elders while still providing a glimmer of hope through self-sacrifice gives the host a progressive follow-through, with blankets of pure white snow in the final sequences hinting quite movingly at a new beginning. The sheer enigma of Mother's opening sequence is a challenge and an enticement to the viewer. Who is this old woman in a field, and why is she dancing while facing the camera? It's a stunningly odd prologue, a rare case of Bong working outside of traditional realism, and it inaugurates what is his most detailed and intimate character study, a drama about an unnamed widow, played by Kim Hee-ja, whose mentally handicapped son is accused of murdering a girl in their village. This setup obviously recalls memories of murder, and the films are quite closely related within his filmography, but instead of focusing on detectives trying to stay on the right side of the law, Mother plays with the tropes of the vigilante movie, as its title character becomes determined to clear her son's name and apprehend the real culprit, that is assuming that the boy isn't guilty. So it begins as an uneasy, but very much much identifiable story of a woman trying to protect her offspring mutates slowly and quite scarily into a portrait of her own damaged pathology. In attempting to catch a killer, she reveals herself as being capable of anything, including murder. There's great comedy in the scenes of Mother's amateur sleuthing, a Hitchcockian control of suspense, and it plays up the incongruity of this older woman running around between crime scenes, looking for clues, trying not to get caught. But what's going on is also deadly serious. Mother's love becomes twisted into something diabolical, evoking the maternal menace of Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho. If you imagine a movie where Mrs. Bates is alive and well and caring and covering for Norman, you're in the ballpark of what Bong is attempting here. This is a visually and thematically dark movie. It's shot in ugly buildings amidst all kinds of signifiers of social and economic inequality. And it's framed by these pastoral interludes at the beginning and the end. Visions of the natural world that are still not quite reassuring the way they are in Barking Dogs Never Bite. The final sequence finds a rhyme with the opening dance, showing the mother lost in ecstasy after practicing self-acupuncture on a tourist bus full of her peers. And here we have reality and fantasy merging together, an image of insanity as catharsis that seriously fucks with the idea of a happy ending, even to this awful story, and shows Bong again very ambitiously transcending realism and working in a completely poetic vein. Now, as in the beginning, I belong to the front. You belong to the tail. When the foot seeks the place of the head, a sacred line is crossed. Know your place. Keep your place. For his much-anticipated English-language debut, Bong adapted a French graphic novel but a massive train circumnavigating a frozen planet, a post-apocalyptic allegory in which the class stratification of human society actually survives the end of the world and reasserts itself in a high-tech equivalent of Noah's Ark. Befitting its global themes of climate change and wealth inequality, Snowpiercer gathers together an international cast and matches that cast to a patchwork aesthetic. More than any of Bong's Korean films, Snowpiercer is made up of scraps of other sci-fi and fantasy movies from around the world. This includes having the late John Hurt play a character whose name is Gilliam in honor of director Terry Gilliam who made Brazil and Twelve Monkeys. In a way, Snowpiercer's enclosed dramatic space calls back to the apartment complex of Barking Dogs Never Bite, except the vertical alignment of that film gets flipped on its axis. Here, the movement is not up and down, it's left to right, as a band of passengers led by Chris Evans in noble action hero mode try and make it from the rear of the train to the front compartment. And so what we get is the class struggle visualized almost as a side-scrolling video game. Everything about Snowpiercer has been wildly stylized. The color palette, the costume design, and at times the lack of realism hurts Bong a bit. 
He has a gift for making the everyday seem uncanny and the outrageous acting of people like Tilda Swinton and Ed Harris and the incredibly unrealistic backdrops can actually make his social commentary seem more literal than usual. It's a little more on the nose than in his Korean films. But Snowpiercer is still an original vision and Bong's clashes with his distributor Harvey Weinstein cast him as a hero in a real life struggle that almost paralleled the movie's plot with this plucky, determined Korean auteur pitted against a transnational Goliath trying to ensure that his work got seen on its own terms. Snowpiercer's final grace note simultaneously nods to Barking Dogs Never Bite and also to the host, with open air and snow and the possibility of something new and beautiful emerging out of an otherwise dark and foregone conclusion. Ten years ago, 26 local farmers from 26 far-flung countries were each given a super piglet. This year, I traveled to each one of those 26 farms to decide who will be invited to the best super pig fest in New York City, where it will be unveiled to the world. You've done an incredible job. Thank you. No less than Quentin Tarantino once famously compared Bong to Steven Spielberg. And even more than the host, Okja is Bong's Spielberg movie. It's his E.T. versus the host being his Jaws. Actually, we might say Okja is more like E.T. by way of Jurassic Park. It's named for and features a genetically modified super pig who, like the monster in the host, is another example, a much more benign one, of a small thing who's allowed to grow big. This time it's by design. Okja's not an accidental mutation, she's a corporately engineered project, bred as a publicity stunt and destined to become a media spectacle, which is a commentary on the logic of special effects movies. Even as Bong is working with a $50 million budget from Netflix, he's kidding that idea through the character of Okja that people like to come see CGI creatures. Now, Okja's kidnapping by a group of eco-activists with an anti-corporate agenda kickstarts a very twisty, somewhat cluttered plot that visually moves once again from serene and beautiful nature scenes to uncomfortable urban sequences. As in E.T., the bond between a child and her non-human best friend yields equal measures of suspense and sentimentality and pathos. The movie is structured as a series of chases, during which Okja is sometimes cargo, sometimes participant, and sometimes pursuer. The momentum and velocity of Snowpiercer gets duplicated and maintained for the film's duration, minus all that claustrophobia, because it's more of an open-air movie. What is unique about Okja's child's eye view of the world is how dark Bong lets it get. In a deeply unsettling final segment, we see the high-tech abattoir that's been built to harvest Okja and other super pigs. Incredibly gory imagery that indicts contemporary mass production practices while playing, however abstractly, with the images of concentration camps. Okja's deliverance at the end of the film is juxtaposed against the reality of a larger slaughter, although as in the host, hope manifests in the deal of a single symbolic child, in this case Piglet, saved. And in the sublime final sequence, we see this young creature integrated into the family unit in a way that reminds us of the host's dinner scene, except instead of being inside a sad fantasy, it's a tender and somewhat promising reality. 뭐 이게 산수경석인가? 추상적으로 볼 수도 있고. 오, 아시네요. 저희 할아버지께서 육사 시절부터 이 수석 수집을 쭉 해오셔 가지고 지금은 뭐 저희 집 아래층, 위층, 거실, 서재 이 수석들이 꽉차 있는 상태입니다. 근데 특히 이 돌은 가정의 많은 재물운과 합격운을 몰고 가시면서 야, 이거 진짜 상징적인 거네. It's very metaphorical, exclaims one character early in Parasite. And that's a line that kids bong subtextual agenda while also doubling down on it. Parasite, we might say, is an extremely metaphorical movie, using the story of a lower class family who live in a basement apartment, ascending to bourgeois aspirations as they infiltrate the home of a high class family. They are coming up from the underground and into the modern aristocracy. When we see the Kim family's environment being fumigated early on, the joke is embedded in their own cockroach-like tenacity. 
The question of whether they truly become parasites on the underbelly of the wealthy employers who take them on, without knowing that their new employees are all related, is left open. When the bosses go away, the Kim family lounges in the living room as if they own it, and they speculate on how nice it would be to have so much money, and also how nice they would be themselves if they had that much money. This being a Bond movie, there are more levels here than just simply upstairs, downstairs. And tread lightly if you don't want spoilers, but the way the house literally opens up to reveal hidden depths, and with them some other inhabitants, counts as perhaps Bong's best engineered surprise ever. It recalibrates the narrative and moral trajectory of Parasite's story, and it turns it from just a simple snobs versus slobs comedy into a sort of secular myth about the monsters milling about under the surface, and who has made them that way and kept them that way. As evidenced by its multiple Oscar nominations for editing, production design, and direction, Parasite is, first and foremost, a marvel of technique, with Bong using his usual directorial tactics, drawn out slow motion, whip crack editing, space and architecture as character, to put across the action without a wasted line or moment. And the perfectly calibrated ensemble acting, led once again by Song Kang Ho, represents a step up from the over-the-top theatrics of his English language efforts. Parasite's near-universal acclaim might seem to some people suspicious. After all, how caustic or cutting could a class satire be if it's been embraced by mainstream audiences or if it's been embraced by a group of voters as bland as the Academy? The answer to that question, I think, lies in the way that Parasite manages to go broad without compromising its intelligence or the deeply felt bleakness at its core. This is a movie that diagnoses cycles of aspiration and subservience and shows how hardwired belief systems are, how difficult it can be to escape not just from one station, but also from a set of predetermined views. And I think it dispenses that equally across all the characters in the story. In its way, Parasite is a more closed and despairing film than any of its predecessors. It is absent the little glimmers of hope that we get at the end of some of Bong's earlier films. It's tremendously perceptive about personal and political and social traps, even as it confirms Bong's ability to elude and exceed expectations and limitations of genre and of national cinema and even of storytelling conventions themselves. Whether or not it ends up triumphing in any major categories at the Oscars, it may end up being a bit of a paradigm-shifting movie in that regard, and as exciting as Bong's body of work is to this point, can't help being even more excited for what he might do next. Yes! Wow. Ooh.